Okay, I've got a, I'm about five minutes behind, so I might zip through a few things. Okay, so uh, in 2015, uh, HPE Linux was an internal Linux distribution based on Debian Jesse. Uh, it was, if you went to this talk last year, uh, you might have seen one of my colleagues give a, a 2014 version, uh, and it used to be called HLinux, but when uh, HP was split into two companies last year, uh, it's, the marketing people got a hold of it, and it's now called HPE Linux, which is much more of a mouthful to say. Uh, we had one customer, uh, one internal customer, customer HP Helion, which is uh, HP's uh, hybrid cloud product for uh, large-scale installations of OpenStack. Uh, for, okay, and for things that aren't in Jesse, we have this idea called foreign packages, where uh, you can add, we would add uh, new uh, packages that weren't in Debian. We can add them as a foreign package. Uh, we can backport secu security fixes or add different versions and just generally have uh, things that aren't Jesse uh, in our Linux distribution. And obviously we, well, not obviously, but we would like to keep uh, HP Linux as close to Jesse as possible, but unfortunately that's, uh, can't do that all the time, so, but we have the foreign packages but yeah, with the idea that they're temporary and that we would like to uh, replace them with free versions whenever possible. Sorry, Debian versions whenever possible. Uh, in kernel land in 2015, we we're using kernel 3.14 and later 4.1, and we had a big kind of uh, testing program where we would uh, do qualification and performance testing uh, to ensure everything works out of the box. Okay, so in 2016, what does HPE Linux look like in 2016? Well, it's still an uh, internal HPE, sorry, it's still an internal Linux distribution based on Debian Jesse. Uh, and at the end of last year, the CTO named HPE Linux a technology standard within the company. And this is a pretty, this is a pretty big deal. And I think it's pretty exciting. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, and we've grown from a single internal customer to a half dozen or so uh, internal customers, all building products in various stages of development. Uh, we still have the foreign package idea, so we're, uh, but we've, uh, in, during, in, in this last year, we've managed to replace a couple of the foreign packages with uh, free versions. Uh, and uh, we've also started using Jesse, Jesse backports as a way of getting, uh, replacing, we're well, getting more up-to-date versions of packages into HPE Linux. And of course, we're still keen on minimizing the difference between HPE Linux and Jesse. Uh, and yeah, this year, uh, we're still doing our, we moved to a 4.4 kernel, and we're still doing our uh, testing uh, program. Okay. Okay, uh, as mentioned in the last slide, HPE Linux is now a technology standard in HPE, and this means that all, all new products and major releases of existing products that use an embedded Linux now have to use HPE Linux, which is basically Debian. And this has a whole host of benefits, and I think it's, it's really exciting. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's pretty exciting that a company like HP has chosen to use exactly one version, a uh, distribution of Linux within the company, I think. Uh, prior to that, there were about 11, maybe a bit after 11 different types of Linux. 11 to 14. 11 to 14. Wow. Okay, that's. I didn't think there even were 14 different distributions of Linux. But, uh, okay. Anyway, so 14 done one. I think that's that's really a good thing. Uh, and so, what does this mean for? What does this mean? Uh, I think it means more investment in Debian by HPE, uh, and we've grown from a since we've grown from a one customer, internal customer, up to a half dozen, it also means we're making more uh, developers, hopefully, de more Debian developers, hopefully little d and big d Debian developers, and we're also making more users. And included in that is customers as well. So I think, uh, like any company, the customers come in a range of different kind of technical sophistications, and. Uh, Customers, some customers actually like logging in to their product and poking around and seeing what's there. And they, I believe some of them are, are, are 
happily surprised to find that they're running Debian. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, and sadly so, some products and market segments can't be switched over to Debian. So I think there is a, an exception process for uh, customers like uh, telecommunications or other people who need some uh, real-time requirements and other things that can't be satisfied with a general Linux distribution. Okay, so what we did in lessons learnt, uh, I'm going to divide that up into three different sections talking about product, what we did in a product way, what we, what we did uh, in the community, and what we did in terms of process. So firstly, I think uh, in this, this talk last year, Josh, uh, Josh mentioned that we did, sorry, the person who presented this talk last year, mentioned that we did a successful kind of 1.0 release of, of uh, Helion using HP Linux as a base OS. So that went, that went really well, and we did this year we did a bunch of 2.x releases and just recently a 3.0 release. And uh, yeah, I think I've been a bit lucky uh, in that a few of the products that were uh, forced, uh, highly suggested to use HP Linux, were based on Ubuntu, and it's not such a big jump from Debian to Ubuntu, sorry, from Ubuntu to Debian. Um, so that, uh, I think that worked out pretty well in terms of getting new customers on board. Uh, HP Linux is a technology standard. <coughs> uh, lessons learned, uh, I think you treat your reference customers really well. We had one customer in 2014, uh, Helion, and I think we made a really good effort to treat them well, and they you know, spread, the, spread the word among the company, I think, and amongst the management that uh, HP Linux was, uh, worked really well for them. Uh, yeah, they gave us a very uh, tight series of deadlines, uh, that we managed to get everything working for them, and I, think, I believe everyone was reasonably happy in the end. Another lesson, uh, delivering enterprise software on Debian is, is definitely possible, and uh, I think that's mostly uh, something that we showed inside the company, uh, that we can, do, we can do what we said we were going to do using Debian. Um, <coughs> Uh, yeah, in terms of telling an entire company they have to change the Linux distributions, I think that could have been could have been bad. Uh, but if it just if it just works and you've got support in place, uh, there's generally not there wasn't I don't think there was a huge amount of pushback on that. And parallel to that, centralization is really important for uh, letting people know how to use H Linux, what it's all about. You can't just tell people to go and use Google and expect them to be happy. You need some, uh, some central locations for documentation and mailing lists and kind of human points of contact. Uh, in the community area, uh, we, uh, this year we re replaced some of the vendor packaging, some of the foreign packages, with free packaging. So with the assistance of, with a lot of assistance from the package Java team, we built a version of Elasticsearch, uh, the uh, open source text indexing and searching engine. We replaced the vendor packaging uh, with a free version in Debian, which you can use now. And ditto for Docker, uh, that is, not, is available now as vendor packaging, which is, vendor packaging is someone, uh, the vendor author, sorry, the parent company uh, has built this binary blob and you install that. And you, you can imagine that people might not necessarily be keen on that. So again, with lots of assistance from the package Go team, uh, we have a really nice new spanking 1.11.2 actually, uh, version in, of Docker in Debian. And that was uploaded to Unstable yesterday, which is good. Uh, in the community, we did some... Uh, uh, Lynn, uh, sitting over there, has done some help doing some contributions to UFE Secure Boot, and that's apparently being shipped to customers. Uh, and we are working on that on ARM64 as well as AMD64. <coughs> and uh, Martin, Martin Micklemeyer, who may be here, uh, he did several full rebuilds of the ARM64 archive on some of, the, some of our hardware, uh, complete with kind of filing bugs and uh, doing uploads and things like that. So that was, that was a was good fun. The lessons here, uh, working with the community takes takes a lot of time. I mean, that's uh, 
you can't, I mean, I, I, as we've seen in the internal land, you can't just come into a community or uh, uh, some group within uh, Debian and dump a whole lot of stuff on them and say, here you go. No, you've got to kind of build relationships and trust within the community. And that takes a long time. Uh, it takes a lot more than you think it would. Uh, um, the other lesson, it's, uh, yeah, it's actually hard work convincing people to get really involved in the Debian community, despite kind of the, our bosses saying, it's fine, you can do it. You, know, you go ahead and do open source stuff. It's still hard for people to do. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, uh, from a time point of view, and also, if you're not used to working out, working out in the open, having all your work available for scrutiny by, by everyone, I think that can be a bit uh, that can be a bit confrontational. But yeah, hopefully, <coughs> hopefully next year we can say we've got some uh, some more Debian developers and uh, Debian maintainers. <coughs> and finally, our uh, uh, process improvements. So I think we've did a really good job this year in getting HP Linux uh, going inside the company, getting it used by lots of different people, lots of different groups. But unfortunately, I don't think success has really led to uh, any, giving even us any more resources, any more people, or any more money. In fact, uh, quite the opposite. Uh, <coughs> so yeah, as a bit of a theme, I guess over the last four or five years, we always have to do more with less. And I think the best way to do that is, is through process, better processes and improving your processes. And to do that, well, one of the things we've done is implement this, uh, what's called a baseline release process where it's a, uh, uh, every four weeks uh, we generate a new version of HP Linux. So half of that for two weeks, developers in the company can upload new versions of packages, <coughs> uh, do all the testing, and then there's a, f a freeze, a very short, comparatively short freeze, and there's a two week phase of uh, load testing and install testing uh, and things like that. So, that and then, so every month we have a new version of HP Linux. Uh, for customers to try out. Uh, we've been doing lots of package acceptance testing, so when you do a D put, there are a whole <coughs> suite of tests run, run against that uh, package, and they're actually more strict in some areas than Debian, which is, which can be a bit frustrating if you need to uh, add some, need to go back and fix a bunch of things. But we've got lots of metadata, we're trying to keep the metadata consistent, we're trying to add more metadata, so we can do package analysis and package tracking uh, also, in <coughs> similar thing in security, uh, as well as following along with the Debian security team, we have our own uh, internal security team with our own well, open source and proprietary tools to do more uh, security uh, analysis on the archive. And finally, everyone's got to write their own kind of CICD system, CICD system, right? So we've got our own one of those to do. Uh, bare metal, basically doing bare metal and uh, uh, different hypervisor testing. So part of our test suites are running uh, HP Linux on bare metal on various bits of hardware, and also uh, doing testing on the different. So I think we're doing. We're thinking about three uh, supporting three different hypervisors. <coughs> so lessons here. Uh, I think. I think. I think tech, technical problems are actually pretty easy to solve. You. Uh, you know, get some smart people um, in a room together and, you know, a solution pops out a few days later. But, yeah, getting human processes working, I think, is a much harder, much harder problem. <coughs> uh, yes, I think it takes a lot longer than technical problems. And process improvement is, you know, continuous and never-ending. I'm pretty sure we're not going to go back to the good old days when, you know, there were people and money everywhere. So, always got to do always got to be improving our processes. <coughs> okay, so that was the first part of the talk. Are there any, can I uh, quickly see if there's any questions about HP Linux before I go on to the next part? Okay, fantastic. Okay, so uh, <coughs> the rest of this talk I'd like to explore this idea of slides, where are we? Okay, about uh, um, sorry, I've got two sets of slides. Okay, I want to explore the idea about thinking about a Linux distribution using the analogy of a middleman. 
and how we can use that to communicate the value of Debian. Okay, what is it? <coughs> okay, so what is a middleman? Uh, so a middleman inserts themselves between two parties uh, with the goal of making the transaction between those parties uh, easier or cheaper. And ideally the middleman adds, adds more value to both sides than it consumes. And I think uh, middlemen middle probably have a bit of a bad reputation uh, in society at the moment. And people think, I guess people think of middlemen as, as parasitical or you know, not actually producing anything of value. But if you, you know, if you, if they're in between two parties um, and pro provide benefits to both sides, and they don't, you know, consume a lot of that benefit themselves, then middlemen, middlemen can be quite good. Okay. <coughs> okay. Some examples, some examples of middlemen. eBay. So I guess this is kind of an obvious one. Uh, in the, in the, I guess it's, it's even in the mission statement, you know, bringing together buyers and sellers. So eBay, uh, if you've got a whole bunch, want to sell a whole bunch of junk at home, uh, eBay will help you find, uh, you know, some people who want to buy all your junk. Uh, and they uh, take a little, little cut of the transaction. Facebook. I think Facebook is a really good middleman. <coughs> so you've, uh, again, the parties involved are people. And Facebook allows you know you to as a provider of you know status updates about your dinner. Um, you can provide people. You can Facebook you know hooks you up with people who are, who are interested in pictures of your dinner. And although they don't actually charge a fee for that, like like uh, eBay does, uh, Facebook shows you ads. So that's the that's the cost in that transaction. Okay, now getting a bit more abstract here, a middleman, a doctor is actually a middleman. So on one side there's you, and you've got a cold or something, and on the other side of the transaction is, I don't know, medicine, uh, other, you know, other medical specialists or kind of services like x-rays and whatnot, and the, the doctor acts as a middleman to connect you to the medical services and the medical products that you need. And finally, Debian. It's my proposition here that Debian is a is a middleman. Okay, so Debian distribution is a middleman. Who are the who are the parties here? Well, obviously there's users and software. They're kind of obvious, and there are also uh, Debian developers uh, and upstream developers. So it's a bit more complicated than kind of eBay, where you know one person is selling to one other person. There's, you know, many different parties, many different types of parties, all kind of connecting together. And we can we can think a bit about what value Debian adds uh, to each of the parties here. So users get access to a lot of software that works well together, works well, you know, in, inside the system. The software gets access to uh, you know a pool of users, and um, Debian developers you know have access to each other. I mean, you can probably think of other benefits that are that are, are provided by Debian acting as a middleman between these different groups. But I think, yeah, Debian. We get to as a Debian developers, you get to meet other Debian developers to uh, uh, work with and uh, uh, be in a community with. Um, upstream, uh, you know, they get access to a, a well-integrated kind of operating system environment and the users as well. <coughs> okay, so let's. Think about HPE Linux just as a middleman. What value does HPE Linux add to HPE? Well, when we were forming the uh, HPE Linux team, there were some questions from high up saying, you know, why do we need to have all these people working on Linux? Isn't Linux a solved problem? And you can just download it and put it on a CD and run it, and you know, that's it. Um, <coughs> But yeah, so from the point of view of the users, Linux is a Linux distribution is basically a solved problem. Of course, anyone who's actually been involved in putting together a distribution at the at the you know at the technical level uh, actually knows that it's a lot of work. Uh, so I guess in some ways we're kind of victims of our own success in that uh, Debian being easy to use and working well um, uh, makes it appear really easy when it's not. <coughs> I mean that's a valid question to ask too. I mean if you're 
paying for your signing paychecks for all these people. It's a good idea. It's pretty important that you know what value you're getting here, and that's the that's the big point of the section. You know, how can we tell people who are you know signing our paychecks uh, what value we're providing uh, by having a learnt distribution? <coughs> so I've gone through a, a couple of points here that I think uh, the value that HP Linux provides. It's a uh, you know, a centralised point for communications. Um, I mean, a lot of, I mean, people, engineers in within, within HP and you know, elsewhere are pretty technical, gals and girls and gals. Uh, uh, but you know, it's nice to have a uh, centralised point where you can get documentation, um, mailing list stuff. Uh, you can talk about things internally. So HP Linux acts as a centralised point for communications. <coughs> uh, okay, we bear risk. Uh, in the company for technical and legal issues. So, what do I mean by that? Uh, so, if you've got 15, say you've got 15 product groups, you know which one of them is responsible for the SCSI driver working? Say, um, so everyone uses a SCSI driver, but you know no one's actually responsible for it. You know, their response, the product teams are responsible for the product. They're not responsible for making sure <laughs> Linux works. So that's one of the points of value that. HP Linux as a middleman provides. We uh, own uh, some of those common things, uh, technical things. And on the legal side too, I mean, who's in a, you know, a, 50, a set of 15 products, you know, which one of those products is responsible for ensuring that Debian, I mean, that, sorry, that they comply, the product complies with all the legal obligations that we have in terms of licensing and distribution? Well, Again, everyone's responsible, but you know, practically you know, no one is. So, HP Linux uh, acts as a point to to take that risk. <coughs> and in a similar kind of vein, uh, Linux HP Linux allows to sh uh, to share large costs within the company. So uh, there are some certifications that uh, to sell in to sell into certain parts of the U.S. government market. You need to have uh, some particular security certifications, and I believe they're uh, ludicrously expensive to do. And uh, <coughs> again, any, one, any particular product is probably not going to be interested in paying the millions of dollars, uh, whereas as a mid H HP Linux, as a middleman, we can uh, take that big cost and share it, uh, take, a, sorry, take on that big cost, uh, and then share out the benefits of that amongst the uh, other users of the system. We can also uh, enforce standards. So, uh, if we want to say, if we want to make sure, if there's a dodgy uh, CA SSL certificate we want to get rid of, we can in, we can uh, help ensure that all the products within the company have that particular certificate removed, or that we're all using the same version of something. Or you can, you can think of many reasons. Uh, you can think of many different standards you can enforce if you're a middleman between Linux and uh, <coughs> customers. And finally, this one's a bit this one's a bit abstract as well. Uh, insulating users from having to make hard or unpopular decisions. So yeah, let's let's say you want to change unit systems in your distribution. I mean, how who makes the decision? You know, to to uh, uh, change to one system or another. Um, it's uh, you know whatever decision you make, people are going to be upset. And uh, in a kind of in the middleman, less system, individual kind of users might not want to make that decision because it's hard or it's unpopular, but HP Linux as a middleman can make that decision for everyone. Uh, and publicly everyone everyone else can say, oh we don't like this, or, but we've got to, you know, we're forced to do it, but you know, secretly it's what they want to do. Anyway, that's, a, that's an interesting idea as well, I think. Okay, finally, <laughs> so finally, um, so what happens when, you know, you substitute HP, Debian for HPE Linux, and what happens when you substitute your organization for HPE? How can you use, how can you sell Debian uh, inside your organization uh, with this middleman analogy? I think it'd be good to think about that. Yeah, I think the middle, the middleman idea is powerful, is a powerful way to communicate uh, the costs and benefits of Debian within an organization because it's, you know, it's an analogy that people are familiar with, you know, middlemen are everywhere in society. And by thinking about Debian, the Linux distribution as a middleman, I think you can help explain things to, to other people quite well. 
Okay, so finally, uh, so some ideas in this talk was taken from a book called The Middleman Economy by uh, Marina Krakowski. And she uh, goes into a lot more detail here. She breaks uh, middlemen down into six different categories, which I've, which I've put down there. Um, and if you're interested in, in reading about that more, it's quite a good book. So there's lots of examples of this uh, inside the book. Um, and that's it. So thank you, everybody. We have about 10 minutes. Thank you, Tim, and sorry for the mess up with the slides again. Right. Is, there any, is there any questions? Fantastic. Hi. Um, you mentioned that uh, the HP Linux port started with uh, one internal customer that was HP Helion, yes. and then later, I think you mentioned expanded to a couple of other customers. Mm -hmm. Were they external? Or? No, they're all internal customers still. Okay. By distribution, they don't actually mean we're distributing it. It's, it's, um, it's still internal. As I understand, HP is involved in supporting all the enterprise Linuxes in the market for their actual um, hardware buying customers. Right. Uh, sorry, what was it? So, uh, uh, what are the challenges do you face um, with supporting something like Debian for real world customers? Uh, is there demand among your real world customers asking for uh, something like Debian? A lot of universities use Debian on their machines. Um, when they buy hardware from you, do they really ask for support for something like Debian? Uh, uh, yeah, I think Spidel talked about this last year, I think, and the story was people want to know this support, but they don't actually want to buy it. So uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure what the, the solution to that is. Uh, So we figured out a long time ago that the right thing to do is to make sure that all of the fundamental software required to enable use of essentially any distribution of Linux on our hardware uh, ought to be pushed upstream. And so uh, we worked very hard for a number of years to get all of the drivers required to work with all of our platforms into the kernel.org upstream space. And then we work with the different distributors to make sure that they picked up the right hardware enabling pieces and sort of using recent enough kernels to have our stuff that we need. And, and yes, yeah, so we do go through uh, formal certification processes with the various commercial enterprise oriented distributions because there are a substantial number of our customers that demand one or another of those distributions and expect to be able to buy support contracts and all of that sort of thing. What we've observed is that what people generally care about is uh, who are running uh, community distributions is they want to know that it's going to work. They want to have some confidence that if it doesn't work that there's somebody they can talk to. But they generally aren't really interested in buying commercial support contracts. Or if they are, they want it to be very tuned to them in a consultative kind of way, not a sort of shrink wrap, one size fits all, expensive, you know, per unit, per incident or whatever sort of thing. So we have this sort of hybrid approach where we work very hard to get all of the driver stuff into the upstream repository so that you don't actually have to have you know any sort of special software to run. And then we actually do test a lot of these things, but we make different levels of assertion where if it's a commercial distribution that we've actually run through sort of seriously rigorous testing and we've made specific core support contract kinds of commitments around, we'll describe that as being supported at this level. And then there's sort of a broad breadth <coughs> of uh, support for community and uh, non-commercial oriented distributions. Debian falls into that. We know that there are a lot of people running a lot of Debian on a lot of our hardware. We think that's great. Customers all think seem to think it's great. It seems to work great. Um, but when you start using words like support in the context of a company like HPE, uh, the people who do support for a living have really crisp definitions of the difference between compatible and supported and tested and all of these sorts of things. And rather than trying to explain that to everybody, we just sort of shrug and go, eh, it's, it's going to work fine. And in almost every case, everybody ends up sort of happy at the end of the day. Yeah, thanks, Vito. Yeah, I think our customers are very sophisticated these days and very knowledgeable about Linux anyway. So uh, I think having a support, I mean, people, in some sense, they do a lot of support themselves. But, yeah, so I think BDL's comment about 
So having a more consulting oriented support idea is probably what's uh, what's going to happen. Oh, was a Someone. question over there. Another oh, question. Is there any plan to like release this to the public? I mean, can I like buy a server, a ProLiant server with this in the near future or something? Uh, like? Not that I know of. There are some still unresolved issues in regard to whether you actually externally, dis whether we can externally distribute it, even though it's just Debian, there are still all kinds of legal uh, uh, niceties and things that need to go through it. Yeah, so I mean, there's no, I don't think there is actually any reason why we cannot, but it's just we've got to go through the due diligence and marketing and legal stuff. Is that approximately correct? <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, maybe. Any other questions or comments? You can just use Debbie and Jesse. <laughs> it's pretty close. Okay. So as Tim said a couple of times, what our goal really is, is to have this be sort of as lightly branded a subset of proper Debian as possible. So. One of the things we're working very hard on is to try and minimize the delta between what's in Debian of the moment and what is actually being shipped in our branded subset. And so uh, he's not being facetious when he says, you know, the right answer if you want to take advantage of our work is actually, in most cases, just run Debian and you'll get most of the benefit. Um, if you're actually running our systems, then what you may find is that if you're running uh, one of the software solutions from the company that has an embedded Linux kernel and some user space, you may, if you dig under the covers, discover that it's actually Debian. But the internal technology standard was intended to address all of the places where we were embedding Linux into something that we sell to a customer where the customer isn't really buying Linux. They're buying some application, some solution, some appliance. and if it's got a Linux kernel inside of it, then we are trying to consolidate and standardize to minimize the cost of doing things like federal certifications and security updates and all that sort of stuff. We're not actually pushing this as a branded distro out in the world because we think if you need a full service distro out in the world, Debian is already there and it works just great. This is really, you know, right now for the next period of time, it's all about how do we consolidate all of the work that's going into various embedded uses of Linux inside the company. And um, there's been lots of discussion about how might that grow or expand or be used differently over time. And certainly some of the work that Tim and the others around have been doing to make sure we have all the right container enablement pieces and so forth open up some interesting strategic opportunities. But there's a huge big deal when you decide to actually enter the marketplace with a new distribution, and we're not at all convinced that the world needs that right now. <laughs> okay, so any other questions? Oh, there you go. So I guess if there was sort of one main thing that frustrated you in the process and that maybe Debian could make it easier for yourselves or other people looking to do something similar, then then what would that be? Um, I don't know, it's probably around documentation on the Debian tool, so the tooling for doing the uploads and that kind of thing. I mean, I think there was a bit of uh, teeth gnashing and hair pulling over, you know, how it all worked. But yeah, I mean, it's, I guess it's difficult, those tools, to, to make them, to kind of publish them and make them generically available as, you know, a product, not a product, as a separate package because they just use, it's one, it's a system that's used once, you know, it's used inside Debian and I guess it's a bit harder to take that out and, you know, file off the Debian bit and stick someone else's version on it. Yeah, off the top of my head that's what I'd say. <laughs> Good question, thanks. So, any other questions? If not, then let's, oh, there's one. Oh, good question. Um, I'm really pleased to hear that you and, and the people around you are, are pushing um, contributors towards being DMs and DDs as well. Because okay. we hear an awful lot about HP's sponsorship in hardware terms and in money terms and mm, things are okay. great, but okay. in people terms, it's fabulous as well. 
Um, I don't normally do this, so I hope I'm not going to embarrass you, but uh, I think we should welcome um, our newest W developer, and may there be many more to come. <laughs> Thank you. I guess that's a nice end. Final point, do you want to say something more? Oh, no, no. Oh, thank you. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.